So, this is a quick one. Uh, we have another shortish one here, but no less interesting. Uh, this one on AppSec and failures in AppSec, and more importantly, how to avoid them. Uh, again, things grow in complexity as time goes on. I think everyone would agree that there's no such thing as a non trivial secure piece of software, uh, and trying to do one's best in order to think security in the programming. Uh, uh, process, it's extremely important. Uh, with that, I'm going to quit yammering up here. I'm going to let Rebecca take the floor and let's see what she has to say. Hey. Woo. Hey, a little bit louder for her. Thanks, everyone. My name's Rebecca Deck. We're going to probably have to talk real fast because I've seen a lot of crappy software and I've got to try to fit it into a very short period of time, so I will do what I can. Um, but I'm Rebecca Jack. I do application security testing for a living, so I'm a consultant for a company called Direct Defense, and all I do is test software. So web apps, mobile apps, stick clients, pretty much anything anybody's writing, uh, I will test it as long as they're paying me to do it. Um, and I hate when I have to do a bad job, but sometimes the tests are set up so that you really have no way to succeed. And I had like three or four tests in a row back in December, where this happened, and um, I was like, man, I wish I just had a way to tell these clients, if you just do some different things, we could have had a much better test, because I hate watching people waste money. So I thought, well, we'll put this presentation together and hopefully be able to point people to it, um, especially if I notice they're sending me down a crappy test road, and maybe I can fix the problem. So hope I'll try to level set a little bit with what is application security. Uh, so that everyone knows what I'm talking about. And then some things that you can do before, during, and after testing uh, to try to make your test work out pretty well. Uh, and a little bit of background about myself. So my name is Rebecca, and I've been doing application testing for about nine years now. I spent eight years as a software developer. I also did some incident response and forensics work in there. And I was also in the infantry in the Army for four years, as you can tell. Um, so first off, application security and penetration testing are two very different things. So my job as an application security consultant is to find new problems with software, right? So I take a piece of software, analyze it in whatever the appropriate method is, develop exploits, uh, maybe I write Python scripts, maybe I write Metasploit modules, and pass those off. If we're doing that pen engagements, um, then I'll pass those vulnerabilities and exploits off to the net pen team, and then that way they can use those while they're attacking somebody's networks. But we're really only looking at one tiny piece of this big puzzle when we do application security, as opposed to net pen people who are looking at the entire network, right? So you have to do, you have to have very different approaches, but a lot of times the people who are running the test on the consumer side are the same people that run penetration tests, and so they go into it with this mindset about penetration testing, and that's what we're going to be doing. Sometimes they even call what I do application penetration testing, which further muddies the water. So that's a, one of the big roots of the problem, is just those differences, and I'll talk a lot about those today. And during this talk, I'll refer to like any internal app testers as third-party testers. Uh, I used to work as part of an internal team for a while doing application security, but you function very much the same as you do as a consultant, right? You have project teams, they come to you, you test the software, you deliver a report, you have exploits, um, maybe disclose things to vendors, that kind of thing. So first off, when should people start doing application testing? That should not be the first thing you do. Um, application testing is so narrow and focused, and it kind of involves some attacker having knowledge of this internally developed application. So the odds of exploitation are significantly lower um, than you would have with most other exploits. So first look at something like the critical security controls or the Australian signals directory controls. So those are great places to begin that give you very clear steps of, I have an insecure network, how do I go from that to having a secure network? So we're like number 17 or something in application security. So you have a lot to do before you should be talking to me about it. But there are some times when you should test software earlier. So first off, if you plan on selling that software, you're asking that consumer to accept risk um, on their behalf. 
right? So if you make SaaS software and somebody is going to put their data up in the cloud and it's your environment, if you get hacked, then it's their information that's being stolen. Or even worse, if you write my least favorite things are endpoint agents because I feel like by and large they're complete garbage, uh, the endpoint agents are some piece of software that almost certainly runs the system on the premises on everything in your entire infrastructure. So now you're asking that customer to assume risk on all their endpoints for your vulnerabilities. So I get a lot of mileage out of people who want to sell that software. Uh, so you may have to do it for that reason or compliance. If you don't know what to do, maybe you come and ask me. Uh, but you should probably look back at the critical controls or some other framework before you do that because it's going to save you money because I'm a lot more expensive than that. Uh, and sometimes management will only listen to proof of concept exploits. So when I was a software developer, the way I made the jump to application security was I came back from a SANS class and I was like, oh my god, like our software is complete garbage. But when I told my boss, he didn't believe me. He said, well, you are all developing secure software, right? I said, yeah. I was like, look, give me one week, and I'll come up with a presentation. So in a week, I found exploits all over our application, remote code execution, SQL injection, cross-site scripting vulnerability. And he was like, oh my god. I can't believe that our application is complete garbage. But I was able to <laughs> leverage that into me spending all my time doing security. But yeah, so sometimes those proof of concepts really speak to management. Uh, so some things that have failed. So I, I've done tests before, and they had not even run vulnerability scans on their systems. So uh, I did a test a couple weeks ago, and they wanted all this in-depth testing on this application they built. Well, it was running Oracle WebLogic, and I feel bad even telling people to patch Oracle WebLogic, because there's always zero days for Oracle WebLogic. But here I was throwing out exploits that were like four and five years old on this system. So that was kind of a waste of money, right? Um, you should probably be doing good vulnerability management first. It'll work a lot better for you. So don't run into these things uh, prematurely. I had another test where they wanted me to really do all this work on their web app. And the web app was running on a Windows 2000 system. It was publicly exposed with RDP and SMB to the internet. They're like, yeah, maybe this is not where you should be at this point in your security process. <laughs> but sometimes that's kind of where they need to be. They don't have in-house expertise. They need to have somebody else. But before you go talking to a third party about this, figure out what you want to get out of the test. So do you just need a letter saying, I have had somebody look at this, and they say that these are the vulnerabilities in it? I think that's a valid thing that people do. Again, if you don't have the in-house expertise, but again, it's probably much, there's cheaper ways to do that. Or you can go buy a DAS tool or something to scan your app. Uh, but I'll be more than happy to take your money and do that. <laughs> Finding all the bugs, that's kind of what I like to do. Right? I hate um, leaving stones unturned and software running out of time. Uh, getting down to all the little nit noise things because sometimes you're able to chain these vulnerabilities together uh, to some really cool exploits, even with the lower ones. But again, that's not right for everybody. So maybe people are like, look, I just want to know the big problem. But knowing what you want when you go into the test is a big deal. Because otherwise, I'm likely to spend a bunch of time working on something you don't care about. Uh, and again, I hate wasting money. Next, do the apps even work? And it sounds kind of stupid, but I, I work with a lot of software development shops. And I get sent a lot of software that won't even run. And so. I had one a test I wasn't part of, but it was like a hundred fifty thousand dollar application test. And so it was multiple testers across multiple weeks, and they found zero vulnerabilities in the application because it never ran the entire time. It wasn't well done. But as a consulting company, you still have to build these people out, right? You have consultants bench for like a month, so making sure that your software will actually function is a real problem. And the type of testing we do. Uh, if you went to the fuzzing talk earlier, so we do fuzzing. And I've tested apps before where anything that's malformed input is going to crash the entire service. So when you send, mal like since your entire job is to send malformed input, it's a real problem if that breaks your application. So at least knowing that I can type in like 
a 1 instead of an A, right? Like that kind of level of testing or just put a single code in there. Uh, so a lot of times I tell people to develop like integration tests and do use case testing. So I have some talks on that that I've done too. And, and that's a really good way to make sure that your app is at least baseline level of functionality for you engage third parties. Another difference between penetration testing and AppSec is it's okay for me to not test in production. Uh, penetration testers, they need to test fraud systems because only the fraud system like looks that exact way, has real users, that kind of thing. So you do want that kind of thing in scope. But I don't want to even touch a fraud application if I can avoid it because I break stuff all the time, right? We're just doing fuzzing. All I do is send malformed input into your system. So when people come at me with questions like, well, why would you send that? Like, that's not bad. I'm like, I'm like, do you even know what I do? Like, why are we even talking? Um, so I was doing tests of some hotel chains. And it started out testing their production system, even though I attempted to dissuade them. But if you have any idea how hotel reservations work, when you start reserving all the rooms at a hotel, the hotel management gets really skittish. They start wondering if there's like a conference in town, or they're like, why, why do I have 200 booked rooms? My whole hotel is small. Um, so that was a problem. I was like, hey, look, let's go down to your non-production environment. And they were like, you know, that's a good idea before we have any more catastrophes. <laughs> so they sent me to their non-fraud instance. And Little did they know, their non-fraud instance talked to a third-party system, production instance, and I sent a malformed time zone identifier, so instead of one of the valid three-character time zones, or, yeah, time zones, I sent, like, a SQL injection attack, and it crashed this third-party production service, which took down the production hotel reservation system. <laughs> <laughs> for seven different hotel chains. <laughs> really break a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> so that's why I always tell people, for the love of God, do not send me against your production system, because I will kill it. Like, uh, I did a protobuf test a couple weeks ago, and they had these like optional arguments in protobuf, and I said the first optional argument, crash the service. Second optional argument, crash the service. So they just hadn't finished the code, right? There were no error traps on it, uh, which was good to know. But again, I was glad that I was not in production. Which kind of brings me to white box, black box, and gray box testing. So when you do um, white box testing, like you give me the source code, which is how I love to work. Because again, I want to find all the problems. And I want to do it as inexpensively as possible. And in order to do that, if you give me more information, I can give you more vulnerabilities. Because I hate giving, getting to the end of the test, and I'm just like, there are swaths of this application that I know we just couldn't even touch. So black box, you give me no information. So I've had people who want me to do black box tests on their applications, and they like require authentication or something like that, and you can't even look at the system. And as we, when we get into the scope, I'll talk a little bit more about why black box is a terrible idea. But at least gray box, sometimes people don't want to send me the source code, but at least they give me accounts. Sometimes they give me unit test scripts. Unit test scripts I really love uh, because I use those to populate my, uh, my whatever my fuzzing protocol is. So you have to like build out this grammar when you fuzz. So if you can give me that test suite, I can build that out in a matter of minutes, and then I'm just picking things up. If I have to like cobble all this crap together, it's going to be a real problem. But some people don't want to know, right? That's a valid thing, right? You have some kind of pending sale and you don't want me to find any problems, then absolutely no black box. I'll probably find nothing. Uh, you can even ban my IP address and I'll, I'll find nothing for you. I'll just collect your money and move on with my life. But you let me know. I can say, hey look, these people don't want me to find problems. Maybe this test is only going to take me two days instead of building out for like a week or something. But again, burden piles of money, our scope is really limited. Like I said, only maybe like a single port on a single server is my entire scope. So I've had people before, and again, when you test non-production, this becomes a problem. So you might not even have like actual users of these applications. So I was testing an app that ran over HTTP. 
the company knew it was a bad idea. They were like, well, can you intercept network traffic going here and steal credentials? I was like, are there any users? And they were like, well, no, there's no users of the application. That may not be the best way to approach this then, because if there's no users, I can't capture the traffic. I've had people want me to go sit in Starbucks on the off chance that someone will be on the Wi-Fi and connect to their system over HTTP. And I'm like, like, that's really not a good use of my time, right? I'll, again, I'll be more than happy to go you for it, but I wouldn't recommend it if you're trying to get something out of it. But for like net pen teams, they do phishing. That makes sense. They're trying to get into these production applications so that's probably a pretty good way, like it's a decent way to do net pen work. It's just not AppSec work, right? And, and I don't really find a lot of unpatched machines because typically when people roll out software, like that is the most secure point in that piece of software's life, right? Um, sometimes you have new exploits come out, but not often, right? At that point, the, the kernel's fully patched, all of their like services they're running are fully patched, so at least, I'm not gonna find these kind of fast, unpatched um, exploits where I can just like pop things with no information like you would on an net pen assessment. Then our exploits, it takes me a long time to write an exploit. So I did some testing on an IBM Cognos solution a while back and it had a proprietary binary protocol for its authentication. Well, first off, I crashed that service a lot so I wrote a fuzzing script for it in Python, I think, and was fuzzing the application and found out that, hey, it crashed under these certain circumstances. Well, I had to write, I, first I had to capture the traffic, then I had to analyze that traffic, then I had to write a fuzzer. So that was like one to two days there. The fuzzer had to run for another like half day to a day before I started seeing good crashes. Then I had to go in like windy bug and analyze these crash dumps. So that took some more time. Then I had to figure out um, exactly how to write this exploit and exactly what was possible. But it took like maybe four or five days just to develop a single exploit. So it's gonna take me a really long time to do this. And you don't want me sitting there wasting days just trying to guess what's going on in your application. So give me all the information you can and I guarantee I will do a much better job much faster. And again, DOS exploits when you're doing penetration testing, you have a pretty good idea this exploit is going to DOS this system. I don't know that. I'm just chucking stuff at this application and hoping for the best. Um, but when things like airplanes stop working, like they wanted me to do this on like aircraft software in production, I was like, my wife and kids are gonna be flying that day. Like they're really gonna be responsible for doing um, to airports what I do for hotel chains. So, um, give me everything you can. So, addresses for the web applications, any APIs that are used, even internal APIs. So, I, I did a test that involved like some front modeling the application. Unfortunately, they sent me like a diagram of their system, so it was a gray box test. And I was able to think, hey, look, I've got these um, APIs in here. What are the API endpoints on these? Just kind of on a mark. I know that they're supposed to be internal endpoints, but at least let me take a look and see if I can get to them. And sure enough, I could. And they were like such benign stuff as like run arbitrary SQL queries, um, read any logs in the system. So big important things like that. And this was up in AWS. So I'm like Amazon Web Services. So it's up in the cloud. Now, when I'm doing this, I don't sit there and scan the entire cloud on the off chance I'm gonna bump into your API. Mm -hmm. So if it's not consumed by the application I'm testing, I may never find it. So that's why it's so important to give me all that information. Um, and even if I'm white box, sometimes people want me to go and like reverse engineer how to call your API based on your Rails code. And I'm like, I can do it, but it's gonna take me some time to figure out what all these parameters are, what they look like. And again, I want to do it as cheaply as possible. Um, external services, if you can tell me ahead of time that you use Okta, and by the way, don't attack Okta systems because they get upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> you using their software does not give me rights to attack it, right? You don't have the privilege of, uh, of letting a third party do that. So you got to be careful with external services. Um, 
dangerous functions. I was testing a bank account, a banking system, maybe eight, eight or nine months ago, and they had this search page on there, and apparently the search page was single threaded, so it could only run one search query at a time. And again, it had to be done in production, so while I was testing this piece of software, there was not one bank customer that could actually run queries against this in production, which caused a big problem, right? So all kinds of like fires were going off. But if you tell me, hey look, this is gonna be a problem, at least I can like realize that this is going to happen and do very methodical manual testing on the dangerous pieces, uh, things that may cost you money to run, uh, emails, right? So I was testing a piece of software and it generated emails that I didn't know about. So I had sent something like 15,000 emails to the help desk and everybody was just pulling their hair out wondering who this Peter Winter was. If, you, if you've ever used Peter like that's the default Peter Winter that it sends. Uh, so I had things like that. I had another person who, um, when I was part of an internal company, so we did a lot less coordination. They came up to me and said, hey look, um, we have to roll this phone system out can you just in like two hours take a look at it? So I'm like kicking doors in on this application, log in with admin admin, I run Burp Spider, and it had a thing on there that reset it to factory default if you ran a get request for a certain page. So I reset this entire phone system to factory default. And they asked me, they were like, hey, we have a presentation we're supposed to give like a demo in two hours. What? I'm like, why didn't you tell me this going into it so I could be careful? Um, but stuff like that happens, and I feel bad for you. But that took a sale that I did. <laughs> so it takes me a really long time to do this, right? So I'm talking like weeks, one, two weeks for an average application most of the time. And that might be worth it if you're doing like mergers and acquisition type work. Because um, if you're going to buy a company for $50 million, and then I find a bunch of vulnerabilities in it, and then you say, hey, we're not gonna pay you $50 million, we're gonna pay you like $30 million, because we know we have to rework all this. You know, that easily pays for my time, I don't make $20 million a week. Um, maybe if you're, and again, if you're selling the app, if you have a bunch of apps, and you don't know which apps are good and which apps are bad, uh, I wrote a paper a couple, years ago that's up in the Sam's reading room about finding bad applications. So you can do something like that, or you can let me do it. One word of caution, if you have like five apps, you don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad, maybe just let me decide how to spend my time. And I've had people who tell me, you have to spend exactly one day per application. And you look at the first app and you're like, oh, this is awesome, like I'm stealing all this data. And then you look at the next app and it's like fully passed uh, Outlook. Like, look, the odds of me finding anything on your Outlook install in one day are probably pretty low, especially if I can't do brute force. So, you know, just let me decide where to spend my time. Um, with kickoff and testing, if you ask about specific tests, um, so if you know that I want you to test our CAPTCHA install, that gives me somewhere to spend my time. If you say, we allow users to upload JavaScript to the server that's run on the server side, that gives me somewhere to set, spend my time, right? Trying to bypass protections that you may have made. I like to give people information early and often, but beware of uh, over-coordination. So if you want me to sit there and talk to you on the phone for an hour a day, I can do that, but I will do corresponding less testing. And if I have to send you emails saying, I'm testing this system all day, if I have to switch over to another system part of the day, it makes me reluctant to do that. So maybe you don't require that level of involvement. After you do testing, do write regression tests for these pieces of software. Pass the vulnerabilities. Again, it sounds stupid, but some people take these reports and just file them away uh, and get nothing out of it. And that makes me feel sad as a human being. But AppSec work is not the same as NetPen. We have a really tiny scope, so give me all the information you can uh, because it will be cheaper to find vulnerabilities, right? So you try to drive that cost per defect down. So these are a couple ways to do it. Hopefully it was happy or at least and, or fun for people or at least a little entertaining, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, what questions do people have before I run out of time to get kicked out of here?
<laughs> so overall, can you say if there's an industry that does uh, app development really well compared to other industries? Is there a... So, bigger companies that do a lot of software development, personally, I like DevOps shops, as I'm sure a lot of other app tech people will want to like blog me for it, <laughs> but when I work with DevOps shops, I found vulnerabilities and they're like patching them as we go. So as I'm like turning in results, they're patching this stuff in live on production. And it's not breaking everything, which to me is amazing. Um, but if anybody wants to talk about like the process DevOps people go through, that's been kind of my jam for a while. So I love talking about DevOps. But yeah, anybody else? Yes. Uh, probably for what you say, financial institutions usually have a lot of custom apps because a lot of the criteria like that. Harder to get people to correct issues or to accept the issues? <laughs> I'd say people accept them quite readily. Um, I've done some other tests where you can really do some damage. I, I worked in financial services for a long time, and uh, there's a lot of problems with a lot of things. Anything that was written before 2014 is probably going to be really bad, um, like just from an architectural perspective. So that's kind of one of my red flags. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I'd say that they accept it, and then they accept the risk and move on with their lives because it's just this giant turd that they don't want to have to deal with. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I, I uh, deal a lot with this with my own internal company, but I'm not a developer. So how how could I approach talking to the development teams about things that I know about that they are not focusing on? Be their friend. So every time I was talking to somebody about this earlier, I do a lot of SDLC consulting. And the biggest thing is to be very patient with the developers because they have a lot of pressure that we as security people are not aware of. So framing all your discussions with them being like sensitive children and you don't want to scare them away. <laughs> because your, your job is to call their baby ugly and tell them they're doing a bad job. <laughs> And then you have to ask them to fix the problems. So, but I can talk with people out in the hall if you want about some strategies to do that. Because uh, I've got a lot of them. I just finished up some presentations on it, so I'm right in the middle. But yeah, if anybody else has questions, I'll, I'll be in the hall. Another round of applause.